what's up, everybody? It's Mr. Talk Box. Check it out. You need to like, subscribe, and catch a YouTube family and YouTube world, I hope everyone is well and blessed like I always do. I mean it from the heart. Listen, before we get started, please go like and subscribe to the DOA playlist. Please do me that one favor and uh, I would appreciate it. Listen, y'all see this brother right here? Wait a minute. Do y'all see that brother right there looking like a rock star, the funky brother right there? He's, you know, the rock star that he really is, y'all. Y'all see that gentleman right there with that funky hat looking, looking dapper. Listen, when I tell you, I'm so glad to have this brother here with me today. Um, we go back a long time. Almost everybody that's on here, we go back because I'm an old, I'm an old guy. So I go back a long time with a lot of people. <laughs> but me and this, but me and this good brother here, man, this is like my road brother, my road dog, my, my cat that's been in my life for. A lot of years, I, wa I watched. I watched his kids grow. He watched my kids grow, get grown. Um, one of the funkiest bass players on the planet. Um, once you get a chance to hear his story, everybody's going to agree um, with all these words that I'm telling you right now. All right. So I want y'all to kick back and come on and hang out with me and my brother as we just bring y'all into our either our phone conversation. Uh, when we riding in the car, or uh, when we just chilling in the studio, living room, and I, and just bring you into our conversation, how we always do. All right, y'all show your love for my brother from another mother, the one and the only, Toddy Funk Christian Lawton. Give it up for him, Toddy Funk. <laughs> hey Toddy, you, hey let me make sure my phone is turned off. Hey Toddy, you see how I gotta break all the names down, right? At the break, <laughs> all the names from all the eras. You feel me, man? Toddy Funk, man. Todd, what's up, man? No way, no way, man. It's it's a pleasure to be here on your show, bro. Um, I've watched your podcast. I remember. Uh, Several years back, you know, you were you were the first guest on my podcast, the Tidy Funk Show, and uh, you know I was blessed for that man. There's some stories y'all haven't heard DOA story on my podcast. You got to check it out. But I'm not here to promote my thing. I just want to let y'all know that me and D go back. We got stories. <laughs> we got life stories. He's been there, man. Uh, hmm. Dude, from from man, you were too deep. We've been knowing each other from. What, uh, 89, 90, somewhere around? Right about there? 80, about 8, no, at least 89, 80, like 88, 89 ish in that era, yeah. man. It, oh, it goes yeah. just yeah. along for a lot of years, man. No, f listen, I want to thank you, man, for hanging out with me, uh, yes. Toddy Funk, man. I, I know how busy you are, man, and, and, and I just want to thank you, man, for just coming and kicking it with your brother today, man. So I can, you know, love on you on my platform, man. And Absolutely, I, I, I want people to know, you know, get to know you through me, man. And, you know, know they'll understand why you're special in my life, man. As a funky right. bass player, funky producer, songwriter, singer, just 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 a whole package, man. And um I'm just thankful, man, that you're here hanging out with me. Toddy Funk. Man, how you been? You, how how oh, you man. been? I love you too, man. How you been, man? You been good? Man, I've been good. You know, it's been good, D. Um you know, and, and actually this is really cool because uh I haven't really talked a lot about the transition that's happened over the last couple, two or three years. So this would be a great chance for for for, for my audience too you know they look back on this to see this because i haven't shared this even on my platform so this is this is almost like coming out for me cool you know um so uh what's been up with me lately uh we can start in 2021 you know covid you know covid had set in in a big way 2019 2020 21 um 2021 in january uh uh toby mac seven-time Grammy Award-winning artist that I've played with for over 20 years. That's when our uh, uh, story ended. 
was in 2021 January. And so there's been some life changes. You know what I'm saying? There's there's been a few you know there's been a few things going. We won't get into everything right now. We may have to revisit that at some point. But I am, you know, uh, just just refiguring and reinventing myself. You know because the I mean we were doing business together during COVID. You know it was during COVID when when I was approached by an entity out of Mississippi while I was in Nashville to do a boutique record label in Nashville. So the first person I called was Derek D.O.A. Allen, you know, to to not only be the vice chair, but to supervise all the music endeavors that were going on at the label. And we had, you know, we had so many involved, you know, I, I can go ahead and say this, my, 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 my partner in crime, Dwayne Brown at Sony and uh, Egypt Ali, our, our little sister, you know. So we've been doing business since, 2021. So when, you know, when, when that situation uh, uh, was not realized, you know, I was met with some, some other challenges and uh, I left Nashville, you know, Nashville was, was my home, was my music home for, for years. I moved to Nashville in 98. And it was really interesting because coming from Oklahoma City to Nashville, it, you know, I didn't know about this CCM music industry, if you will. You know what I'm saying? We grew up, we knew gospel. We knew gospel music. You know, I didn't know that there was another side to gospel music that was like a distant cousin. You know, they didn't, they didn't really play well together, but they were related just because of the subject matter. But, um, there were friends of mine in Oklahoma City. I mean, Israel Houghton, before y'all knew Israel as Israel and New Breed. Um, Mercy Me, before I can only imagine. Um, Nathan and Christy Knuckles, who later became Watermark after they were signed to Michael W. Smith's Rocket Town label in Nashville. Um, those are, oh, Lincoln Brewster. Uh, who not only played guitar for Journey, but he was out in California playing. I'm, I'm trying to remember the name of the church that he was with, but Lincoln Brewster was an artist uh, himself, you know, uh, singing and playing guitar, Bad Monster. So I was in Oklahoma City, you know, when these guys, we were all friends in Oklahoma City. And, you know, I was at this church, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm sitting back checking these cats out. I'm like, I mean, these guys got their own bands. They're producing their own records and they're doing shows. They're touring. They're on the road. And I was like, wow. And what was interesting is that I was playing bass for uh, Nathan and Christy at the time. And so I was kind of seeing this this this, this synergy around these uh, artists in this industry we call CCM, a contemporary Christian music. And I was like, wow, this is a whole new thing. So I was like, okay, I can get down like that. You know, I'll just, I'll do what I do and bring that to the table. So the first thing I did, you know, I put together a band. It was a rock band called Gibraltar. Um, uh, we, we, we had some interest from uh, Chrysalis out in LA uh, due to a friend of mine that I played with in Austin, Texas named Derek Edmondson. Derek Edmondson, rest up and get well, my brother. Um, he turned me on to his music attorney in uh, L.A. Gary Greenberg uh, flew out to L.A. and Gary loved our stuff. And so um, we, we had a conversation. He was like, man, I really love these songs right here. I, you know, give me some more of these and, and we can make something happen. So I came back to Oklahoma City and said, all right, guys, here's the playbook. Let's go. So we're, you know, in Oklahoma City, you know, and I'm seeing this whole CCM thing moving around, you know, uh, it's another end to the industry. You know, at that point, I was focusing on rock music because um, I didn't really want to do the, the kind of stuff that they were doing. But I said, we can, we can have a little bit more attitude, make it, make it funky. You know, we'll go that route. So um, long story short, the band, when it was time to move to Nashville, everybody got cold feet. And I said, well, y'all, 
you know, we've done everything we can here in Oklahoma City. We went from a no-name band to headlining the best show, the best venues in Oklahoma City and having the top bands open for us. I said, well, we can't do it anymore. We've sold records here. You know, people know us here. It's, it, we got to we gotta let go. So when the band broke up, I said, okay, I'm going to Nashville. And getting to Nashville, man, you guys, I had this... <laughs> Such naivete, man. You know, uh, Tone A was breaking out. Y'all remember Tone A, that first record he did, uh, uh, pronounced Tone A, old record. Kirk Franklin had just released Stomp, you know, with the Funkadelic interpolation of One Nation Under Group. I said, okay, it's time to rock and roll. So I moved to Nashville with this with this grand idea of bringing funk to Christian music. Okay. So... <sighs> Got to Nashville and found out it wasn't like it was in Oklahoma City. Oklahoma City had this radio station. I can't remember the name of it, but, um, and I can't think of Ken, what's Ken's name? Ken, I want to say Ken Pennell was a music uh, director out there. Uh, station was off the chain. D, they were playing R&B. They were playing hip hop. They were playing like the gospel version of CCM with Margaret Becker, with DC Talk, with all the other pop artists. So it sounded like a real radio station. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't as polarized as when you listen to K, uh, K Love or uh, Way FM. You know what I'm saying? This station was banging. I said, okay, if this is what's going on, I, I can get out because I want to be a part of this. When I got to Nashville, man, it was like, okay, y'all over here. <laughs> And y'all over here. And the only situation in town was Toby Mac. As far as trying to be something that was diverse, something that was inclusive for us as black people. I'm just going to say it like that. To be able to play music and bring music the way that we do. I think at the time when I got to Nashville, he had Out of Eden, the three sisters. You know, they were kind of a uh, a take, take on all things female R&B that we knew, you know, from In Vogue to, uh, you know, uh, 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 Jay to, you know, the female aspect of R&B. You know, that's who, uh, that's who um, uh, Lisa, Danielle, Kimmy, the girls, I uh, forget the other sister's names, sorry, sis, um, as out of beat, and they were, they were appealing to that audience. And uh, Toby had a, a rap group called Bricks that was banging, you know, and um, he had he had some other things that were more R and B leaning. So I said, okay, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna play in this arena, I need to be with this dude because he's the only one who's opening up his arms to black people and black music, you know. And it's really interesting, y'all. And dear, I'm just going to speak candidly if I can. You know, you tell me <laughs> if I go too far to the left or to the right. But, you know, you, you would think as a Christian industry, but that's what it is. It's a business and industry first, okay, that it would be more inclusive. And, y'all, I tried to crack that nut a hundred different ways, you know, because I said, all right, the music that we grew up with, R&B and funk music, I said, these people, their kids, you know, that I'm seeing at these shows, you know, with Toby Mac, I'm like, these parents, they know Gabby. You know, they know Cameo. They know Lakeside. They know P-Funk. They know all the music that we knew, they knew. You see what I'm saying? Whether it was by Friends Association High School or whatever, they knew the same music that we knew. So I'm like, and their kids were listening already to Dr. Drake, Eminem, Snoop, uh, whatever was happening, hip hop that was R&B. Those kids were already listening to that music. So I'm like, okay, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I just need to do what I do and just make sure that my message is clear so that nobody, you know, uh, 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 gets lost in the sauce, basically. And, and, and you know, while... Um, in Nashville and while on tour, I'm kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but I will go back. You know, I would talk to these, you know, in lines, you know, uh, before the concerts, I would go out and take pictures, 
sign autographs and talk to the kids and their parents. And and Toby allowed us to sell our music. You know, he had three. He had myself, uh, Toddy Funk, Electric Church. He had Nervescence. He had Sean La. He had Arch Nemesis, and he had a he had Superhuman. And those were bands that everybody in the band had. See, Toby had, he had <laughs> within Diverse City, he had a P Funk Empire. And I and I would sit Toby down, I'd be like, look, dude. You know, you got a whole band here that's talented, that we have our own music, that, bro, if you would just co-sign, <clears throat> just co-sign these artists, man, you know what I'm saying? Um, and allow us to do what we do with your blessing. That would be huge. You, you know, you already have Goatee. You already have these artists. But the thing I didn't understand back then was that it was probably more of a conflict of interest because he had artists already signed. But what was crazy, D, is that, man, me, Sean Lott, Ner- and Nerva at these festivals and these concerts, man, we would be out, you know, uh, out the trunk of our car, if you will, or out, or out the gym bag selling loot, man, selling CDs like it's going out of style. And these kids and their parents are like, well, man, why don't we hear this stuff on the radio? Why don't we hear y'all stuff? I mean, here we are with one of the biggest artists within the CCM genre, and these kids and their parents are asking us, why don't we hear your music on the radio? You know, we love this. You know what I'm saying? And that was so crazy at first, man. I, I thought people, I didn't think they were going to like what I did. I didn't, man, I got in a, in a weird space, bro. Because I didn't think, I didn't think anybody would be checking for my music. You know, because dude, I'm a, I'm a diehard funk kid. You know what I'm saying? And, and. That's just what I do. That's what I'm most comfortable with. You know what I'm saying? And when you when you have people telling you that, you know, this isn't going to work for our industry or this doesn't work or whatever, it's it's kind of, I mean, y'all yeah, heard it. Even in the mainstream, you know, when you've got records and the label's telling you, nah, we got that or no, it's not, or whatever. You know, that's that that can be, that can be uh, uh, debilitating to your, to your 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 motivation and your momentum, but man, I just kept driving because I, I said no, no, no. I know this will work. Y'all just ain't trying to let it work. You know that's what I'm saying to myself. And you know, it, and and I had friends who had labels who had these imprints, man. And I'm just like y'all. I was just like, wow. You know, this is crazy. You know, these guys they have imprints with these labels, man, and they're producing these records and stuff. I was like, okay, well, man, y'all know me. Y'all know who I'm with. This is what I do. We ain't got to try to reinvent the wheel, man. These kids are buying this music anyway. You know, over here, you know, on the mainstream, let's just put it out. Just put it out. And let me do some shows, man, because the proof is going to be in the pudding. You know what I'm saying? But D, like I said, man, I tried to crack that in a hundred different ways, man. And it was, it was not until, it was not until I did a GMA showcase. And... I'm trying to remember who it was. Uh, Central South Distribution, and there were some entities from Europe that caught my show with Electric Church. And that's when that's when that's when I got the love. They were like, "Man, dude, we don't have anything like this." So that granted me a birth over in Europe with with my. With, with Electric Church's first record, Ready or Not, I had a single called Dance Floor that featured Talkbox on it. Not Mr. Talkbox, my brother, but uh, at the time I didn't know Box, uh, but Joseph Wooten, one of the famous Wooten brothers, he plays Talkbox, and, and I had him do some Talkbox on the track. And it's funky, it's undeniable, it's fun, it's danceable, you know what I'm saying? And it was, it, and it was just right down that lane. And so folks over across, you know, over across the pond, they got it. And so, you know, my band, we went to, we went to uh, London and we played, we played the fame, the story of club. I mean, everybody coming up, Prince, Madonna, the police, you know, some of the dopest mainstream artists that we know today, when they were coming up in their early days, played the story. So I was honored to, to play that venue before they shut it down. And we did some other festivals and things over there. And the, and the song Dance Floor reached number two on their R&R chart. And we sold out every piece of product we had. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, okay, so this is this is what's up. You know, 
it's it's time to it's time to pull up. You know, Tidy Funk go to Europe, do the thing over there, and then come back over here. You know what I'm saying? So, so Todd, so Todd, let me, let me, man, you you're on such a great roll. I didn't want to stop you. Um, and you 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 put a whole lot of meat on this bone that I definitely want to unpack some of it. Um, okay. Because it's it's very, you know, I get it. Um, and we're going to get into, like, some of the logistics of it without okay. being harmful or rude yes. or disrespecting anybody. But Absolutely. but being truthful and real about the facts, correct? I, yeah. I, I want to back up just a little bit. Todd, where were you born? When or where? Where were you born? Man, I'm just, dude, I'm just a Midwest... Kansas, land of Oz, bro. I'm from the land of Oz, man. I'm from Kansas, from the flatland, right in the middle of this country, bro. I'm from uh, the capital city, Topeka, which is about 40 minutes outside of Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri, on the west side. Okay, so I don't want to go too far back. I want to kind of, because I want to pick up where you left off at. Um, okay. When did you move to Oklahoma? Did you, Oklahoma City? Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah. which one? Where did you move? When did you move to Oklahoma? Man, I moved to Oklahoma City. We moved to Oklahoma City when uh, when I was a sophomore in high school. Okay. So you so, moved yeah. to Oklahoma. When you when you moved to Oklahoma, is that kind of like where the music started or did it start in Kansas City? Did it start beforehand? Man, the music was always there, but professionally, it didn't start until Oklahoma City. Okay. You know, for me, dude, D, I'm a late bloomer. Okay. I, you know, unlike unlike you and some of my other favorite bass players who was playing bass at five years old, okay. six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, playing like grown men. I didn't really start till I was about twelve or thirteen. I understood. So Oklahoma City, you 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 graduated in Oklahoma City. Did you graduate there? I did, and I graduated high school in Oklahoma City. Uh, went to University of Central Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, I left after my first semester because I knew I was just going to school to appease my mother. I knew I wasn't, you know, I, I was ready to play music. So at that time, it was about the music at that time, period. Absolutely. At that time. I okay. Was playing, I was playing a local gig with, uh, with, a, with a local artist named Colleen Shepard. She was a female artist around Oklahoma City who had a name. So that was the first time consistently that I was on a gig where I was making money playing in the Embassy Suites bar. Or the Hilton Bar, or these, you know, or these Michael Sprung, different upscale establishments in Oklahoma City, playing lounge music, you know, top forty lounge. Got you. So you 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 mentioned the fact that you were in a band, and your band, the plan was everybody who had planned to move to Nashville, correct? Yeah. And everybody had planned it, but but everybody kind of backed out of it, except you. You decided to go ahead on and make that move. So, Toddy, why, why in your mind that you, that you said to yourself, I need to go to Nashville? Why? And what was it about Nashville that still made you go and you not back out of it? Tell me about that. Hey, well, hey, truth be known, I want to go. I want to come to L.A. OK, you know, but, you know, L.A. from from Oklahoma City, that's a that's a strong move. And man, if you don't have roots, and I, I came to understand this through my relationship with you, uh, Derek Oregon, you know, some of the other brothers that I knew out in LA, Tariq Okoni, um, you know, it, it, it was like, I felt that if I didn't have relationships in LA, if I didn't grow up or had been out there early in my age, it would have been really tough because it, it, it's just a different climate. Competition's different. People are different. The way people move is different. And again, bro, I'm from the country. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I was like, okay, <laughs> all right. Nashville is close. You didn't know it's close. That might be more my speed. So when you moved to Nashville, was mm -hmm. when you moved to Nashville, was it your goal to just jump into? Because you're right. You 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 are funky dude. Funk music is just in your blood, your DNA, your genes. So when you moved to Nashville, w w was your mindset to go down there to kind of get involved in R and B funk world, or specifically just to go down there and deal with CCM uh, gospel artists, contemporary gospel artists? Man, look, my goal was to 
you know, because of what I was hearing, the, you know, the, the musical styles I was hearing on the Radio City in Oklahoma City, Christian music, I said, okay, I can probably get in there and make something happen myself. You know what I'm saying? For myself. So when I got to Nashville, I was trying to do my thing, right? But then I was like, well, you know what? I could probably get a gig and not work these three jobs and and play music for them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I mean, to play music was always the goal, right? right? And and to me, it didn't matter what it was because I was going to figure out some kind of way to, to to flip it and get to where I needed to be, you know, for for the music that I wanted. You know what I'm saying? So my goal in moving to Nashville, it wasn't necessarily to play with Toby Mack or to play uh, uh, contemporary Christian music as such. But I mean, when I got there, you know, I even played country music. You know, I played with country artists, had a blast because at that time, there was only a handful of brothers playing bass for country artists and men, they loved our pocket. You know what I'm saying? And so you had, you had Willie Weeks down there, Tommy Sims, uh, T-Bone, I, I don't know T-Bone's name, uh, rest in peace, bro, cold-blooded brother from Chicago. And then I got in there through T-Bone, who, who uh, put me on to a, uh, a, Dan Huff, a Dan Huff project with a dude named Shane Miner that was really dope. So I got my, I, I was kind of following that trajectory. I was like, okay, this country music thing would be really cool, you know, because I had uh, other friends who had friends. Uh, J.D. Blair, who played drums for Shania Twain during her biggest years. Anthony Joyner, who was playing bass at the time for um, who was he playing with? I want to say Reba McIntyre, uh, Reba McIntyre or, or, or somebody else. Like, he, he, Anthony was another brother who was getting a lot of love you know, playing playing bass for country artists. So, I mean, we're, you know, I kind of got in on the forefront of that thing, you know, before uh, it's become what it is now. You know, in Nashville now, you see there's a lot of brothers, man, on drums, on bass, uh, for sure. Hopefully it'll open up. We'll see more cats on guitar and, and other, other instruments as well. But um, the, I was just trying to, I was just trying to find a lane. So, you know, so Todd, so, to so Todd, when you moved to Nashville, real quick, did you have a situation set up? Did you have a house? Did you have a roommate? Or when you landed, or what? T- right. Touch on that a little bit. Dude. Yeah, yeah. So, man, no, I was I was married with two kids and one on the way, and I had I didn't have anything set up. Dude. I was going on raw energy and faith and just sheer determination. But the thing that I did have, I had a job. I I worked for Nextel. Remember the two-way radios, the dope radios that you do? I was, dude, we was crushing the game with Nextel. So Nextel afforded me an opportunity to move to Nashville as they were expanding. You know, uh, we were breaking, we were breaking ground when the, when the two-way radios went out of phase. Craig McCall, I don't give you a lot of background. You don't really need, but anyway, Craig McCall bought. He was owner of Nextel, and, and he owned the two-way radio situation. So when they started phasing that stuff out, they started force migrating these companies into Nextel, which basically just gave us, you know, like a stock fish pond in nets. And so, man, we were selling fifty and seventy-five and one hundred twenty-five phones at one time. Okay. You know, and so the so the money was real good. So anyway, all that to say that I had a job situation that took me to to Nashville, whereby I was able to, you know, get a place, get an apartment in Antioch. Y'all know Antioch. That's where everybody goes when you first move to Nashville because it's it's, it's, it's it's affordable. You can kind of get you can land there and get yourself together. And then um, as I was in Antioch, um, you know, I, I would I was working my job, but I was also the I was going down to SIR. I was going to sound check. I was trying to find out who the artists were in town that needed bass players, and so I was playing for a lot of ba- a lot of artists that were unsigned that were doing showcases. You know, so I, w- I was having to learn a lot of music, and, and for a brother that didn't read, that presented some challenges, man. Because I was working a full time job, I might have had twenty songs that I had learned, you know, <laughs> for three different artists, 
and trying to keep all that together. It was it was it was pretty crazy, you know. So so let's but um, let's be sure. When he said for a brother that can't read, that's read music. The yeah, brother can't read. Yeah, can't read. Okay, <laughs> right. talk about read. But go ahead, go ahead, brother. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. For a brother who doesn't read music, I mean that's 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 a that's a pretty heavy task. But yeah. you know, um, I, I I just you know I just I, I made it work, and um, ultimately what happened there was a church that moved from Oklahoma City to Nashville and well, what, happened, what got me is well okay so Danny Chambers rest in peace he was a pastor in Oklahoma City that moved the church out to Oklahoma City and when he was he, he wanted to do a live record so I was still in Oklahoma City so he called me to come play bass on the record so that got me an opportunity to go to Nashville and check everything out um uh that's where I met the Wootens for the first time. I got a chance to go down and see them play at Third and Lindsley. And the crazy thing about that, D, is when I get to Third and Lindsley, I'm watching these brothers, man. I'm watching them play these 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 cover songs, you know, some and some dope B sides. And they were freaking them out, man. I mean, they were taking them out, and they would bring them back home and make so much sense. It was just the craziest thing, man. I'd never seen the Wootens before. So after the show, I go up to the stage and I'm dapping them up, man. You know, hey. Really enjoyed it, blah blah blah. Talking to Joseph, Reggie, and and uh, 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 Rock Williams, who was on sax, and I'm not. I think Raymond Massey was on drums, but the bass player, Paul Chapman, he was looking at me when I was talking to him. And he said, "Hey," he said, "Didn't you play in a band called Prelude?" And when he ch- when he chimed in, everybody kind of stopped and turned around and looked and focused focus in on our conversation. I said, "I said, yeah." He said, "Man." I used to go, I used to sneak into that club to watch you play and watch your band play at, 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 at Take Five in, in the Dallas Hour. I was like, whoa. And right then and there on the spot, he told Joseph and Reggie, he said, look, if y'all ever need a bass player, call him. I hadn't even moved to Nashville yet. And they looked like, okay, a word, okay, on Paul Chapman. I was like, wow, okay. So, man, I ended up giving Joseph my number that night. And then I go back after recording the live record to Oklahoma City. And a few months later, I moved back. Oh, Joseph, Joseph, I'm in town. He said, okay, bro. And this was right before summer. And so a couple months went by, uh, February, March, April. Summer's coming up. I get a call from Joseph Wu. He said, hey, man, can you come and play with the brothers? I said, absolutely. So what I found out, man, is all the bass players, all the first call bass players were gone. They was all on tour. <laughs> so uh, door open wide open, man. And so I knew a great majority of the songs that they were playing because we grew up on them. Right. But they just played them at a different level. And it right. was really good for me because Reg, he, he likes to play it in an accelerated tempo. And, and a lot of times when I was hanging on, dude, I was hanging on by a thread, but it was the best introduction to the Nashville music scene because all the heavies came out to see the Wootens at Third and Lindsley. That's a famous by any of y'all that have ever been to Nashville. Y'all know Third and Lindsley, and at, at one time Wednesday night, that was the famous Wooten Brothers night. I mean, and anybody can show up at that at that group. So that's where I, that's where I got my street cred was from the Wootens. Uh, on Wednesday night, thanks to Joseph Wu. Yeah. And so, the so that's so so right on. So basically, that's kind of like was your introduction to Nashville of your yeah. people knowing who you are. Now let let's go back to where we were. Um, because I want to talk All about right. I want to talk a little bit about it. I don't I don't want to spend a whole lot of time, but I want to kind of get to it and talk about how you were talking about you were playing with this huge CCM artist, probably the biggest Christian artist. You know, even till this day, he's still huge, a lot, well, highly respected brother who you, I know you love dearly. The whole, you know, that whole organization, yeah. you know, you just, it just, it just was a, um, was a great experience for you. We, we, I, I, I rode that experience with you the whole time and I know how, yeah, yeah. how that Absolutely. moment was in your life. So, you know, I want to shout out to Toby, but Toby, you know, comes from the band DC Talk, correct? Absolutely. Toby, let me tell y'all, for those of you guys that don't know who Toby Mack is, Toby Mack gave the Christian music industry permission to take music in a whole other direction and 
lyrically and take words that weren't typically used in Christian music like free you know different things like that you know Toby basically gave the Christian music industry permission just to just to do a, a 180 and just go into a whole different direction right so and, he, yeah he was he was man he was he was a catalyst Toby was a catalyst he was definitely a catalyst man exactly yeah 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 and so when I realized that I was like okay she, this is this could be something big because what 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 people may not know is that I played with DC Talk as Toby Max bass player, but also as DC Talk's bass player on the tail end of their solo tour. And the solo record, <clears throat> that was the record that set Michael, Toby, and Kevin up to go their separate way. So we were doing huge arenas and Toby, uh, we would first do a set as DC Talk. And then we would do a set as individual artists. Got you. So uh, very, you know, very strategic in how they, you know, rebranded themselves and, and launched their careers as solo artists. Got you. But but so what I want to get to, what I really want to get to is the point you made about one okay. of the reasons why you were so excited with getting with Toby because, you know, their influence was... Their influence was R and B music, R and B soul. They there was a there was a lot of that. The culture involved in yeah. in what Toby Mac brought to the table to the CCM side of of the music, and it gave you an outlet to say, okay, you know, it's not too many, you know, not too many brothers or whatever I can do to get the funk funk thing or and whether they were brother, white, black, green, yellow, it doesn't matter. Just right. I can't really. Get I can't really do too much of it out here, but this situation allows me that chance to say, man, I get the chance to be funky. I get a chance right. to be diverse. I get to really play rock. We hit a little bit of everything as well as the right. hardcore CCM music, but we also hitting pop. We hitting everything that I love. Right. But and right. then you talked about how you guys attracted so many People like you, the, the generation that listened to black R and B music, that listened yes, to, sir. that grew up around the culture, listened to the culture, loved the culture, and accepted the culture. So it was a match made in heaven with what you guys and what Toby was doing to his audience. He basically was feeding everybody the the thing that they needed, and it was accepted. By everything right. he he could do no wrong when it came to that right right absolutely but absolutely. I want I want to talk about why do you, you why was it you said you couldn't crack that nut okay why why do you think that it was so difficult. For you to crack it, to, to get into that, being who you are, being where you come from, you know, being the melanin of your skin, being, you know, a brother, a black man, mm -hmm. you know, in a mm -hmm. just different territory that's trying to bring the culture that you live, that you know, probably than most people in that city at the time. Why do you think... It was unaccepted, or they wouldn't accept, you know, which your your offerings to the table. You know, okay. Now, when I say what I'm about to say, I, I'm not trying to hurt anybody or offend anybody. You know, I can only articulate it the way that I can articulate. It. You know what I'm saying? Um, For one, and, and, and this and this 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 is present in mainstream music too, and you'll be able to identify this. All of y'all will that watch this show because you are all uh, heavyweights in the mainstream industry, y'all, and y'all, and we go back, and so you guys have seen this too. But a lot of it, one marketing, you know, they would rather allow someone like Toby Mac due to not only him being a great songwriter and on all that, that goes without saying, but, you know, even like we talked about in private conversations, it's like, it's, it's, it's more palatable for someone who's not black to deliver this sound. 
You know what I'm saying? Because it, it comes off different. And that's an age old that's an age old thing that stems back from Elvis and and you know, the great blues artists, you know, everything else. You know, a lot of it is marketing. You know, um saw I saw it so much even with the sisters. You know, very talented sisters in the CCM industry, but because their melanin was too too darkened, it, it's too much. You know, and, and and unless you had a platform that that you were on, say like Mandisa with American Idol, and then again that was Toby Mac. You know, that wasn't the industry at large that picked her. You know, Toby Mac, he understands. You know, he looks he looks at us differently. I'll say that than in the industry. Because Toby, you know, his whole thing was, you know, diverse city, diversity, you know, racial inclusion, all that. So he got it. But at large, you know, um, you know, you know, Nicole Mullen, one of the biggest songs ever in Christian music history, My Redeemer Lives, you know, My Redeemer. But because Nicole, she is a, <laughs> she's, how can I say it? She's man how can I say this she 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 doesn't threaten them with her musical choice and style it's not like like a Karen White but she didn't go as hard as that or like even Mary Mary you know what I'm saying it wasn't that mm, mm, you know it wasn't, it wasn't it, she wasn't giving them that she was giving them the, you know something a little bit more powerful that they could work with. it was more friendly and so yeah and so what I was seeing, y'all, I'm just gonna be, I just, I, I'm just gonna call it like I said, there's a lot of racism. It's probably one of the most racist industries that I've ever seen in my life. And that's just the truth, y'all. I, you know, I was there. I saw it firsthand. You know, the only person that I felt like would have our back was Toby. But I was like, Toby, he couldn't do it. He couldn't do everything. So it was like, if you weren't like, Jonathan McReynolds or, you know, a black artist who was willing to say, tone down his essence and kind of play this game. Okay, we see what y'all doing. We see we can write worship music. We can dumb down these chords. We can we can play these, you know, one, four, five, one, and you know, we can we can do what y'all doing and, and, and make these melodies and, and not do so much you know, vocal gymnastics and, and just sing the melody. We can do that too. So you had a lot of brothers, you know, changing their style so that they could try to fit in the industry. You know, same thing with the R&B industry. Remember when Tamio came out with Alligator Woman, you know, doing the new both, you know, new wave thing, you know, uh, uh, you know, the big bands were, 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 you know, the big horn bands, you know, had 11, 12 cats and it was three and four in that. And then they changing their style and changing their look just so that they could keep working in an industry that was saying, okay, no, we're not doing this. We're not doing this R&B thing like this anymore. We're not doing this. But CCM, it was like, you know, we, you couldn't even get to the table unless you had this image where you were, your melanin wasn't as dark, you know, your sound wasn't as R and B or gospel. You know what I'm saying? It had to be very pop centric and, and very um, uh, homogenized. You know. So Todd, you came, Todd, you came to Nashville bringing a lot of grits, a lot of gravy, a lot of cornbread, a lot of hog mogs, pig feet, chitlins. And just a lot of dirt, a lot of dirt to a whole different culture, right? So yep. you got all that. You could play your butt off. I mean, no doubt you could play the music. Do you think that is one of the reasons as of why it was so hard for you to pick the lot? Because of all the things that you said that I brought? Yes. It's a good question. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I, I mean, and maybe, and I hope I answer your question, D. You know, I only know 
you know, how to do funk one way, and that's just to do it. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, I try to rewrite funk, try to water it down, try to do a lot of things to try to make it work. But man, you you know, you you, can, you can't fake the funk, man. You just it's got to be what it is. You know, so I know for me, that's what kept me out of those doors in Nashville. You know what I'm saying? Because for myself, I wasn't willing to, you know, you know, strip all the music down and, and, and make it more palatable. I, I, I just wanted to be who I was and, and, and just do what I do, bring what I bring to the table. So I know for me, that was a huge stumbling block. I mean, and I knew the game, you know, but I always felt because I talked to the people that were coming to those shows night after night after night after night, I knew that if somehow I could bypass the industry and go direct to them, I'd be okay. And that's what was happening. And that and that's what was happening. That's how that's how the thing in Europe happened. That's how, you know, even when I was back here, that's how I was able to do some of the things that I did here is because I just went direct to the people because I knew that you know, the industry wasn't going to accept me as this, you know, this black funk R&B artist, you know, trying to sing a, a message that was uplifting to <laughs> their their demographic, you know. And um, anyway, so I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Todd, let me say this, man, and we can move away from it, but I want to make this, put this out here right now. First of all, I appreciate your honesty, man, and your transparency because this is... We're, you're giving us your your facts of the way of what you lived, so mm-hmm. people they can get mad at you or be upset with you all they want, but they don't have the right to. You're telling us your story and how it was for you. That doesn't mean yeah. it was like that for everybody, but you're giving and Todd, right. you've spent a lot of, over what tw- over twenty years out oh, and yeah. Yeah. right. So yeah. a lot of years. In that lifestyle, living that, getting those, a lot of great doors open for you. But at the same yeah, time, right. a lot of great doors, a lot of doors wouldn't open. A lot of doors were slammed in your face. And I know how much this meant to you because, you know, you had your band Electric Church when we met. And I knew how powerful and how important that was to you. And, you know, I would have thought that it was just going to be automatic being the circle you ran in, I thought it was Absolutely. a given. You know, being yeah. the circle you ran in, I just man, I just knew it was going to be a given. So I appreciate you, and I want to let everybody know who's listening to these facts, his story. He's speaking his life experience of what he dealt with and what he went through, and I'm here to attest to it because a lot of everything he's saying, I, I was right there. I was right there watching you go through a lot of rejection, man, on your ideas, your your creative, you know, your creative um, uh, 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 energy and your 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 the things that you wanted to do for your future, man, and take care of your right. career and expand your goals. So instead, what you did was you shut it down and said, you know what, I'm just going to be the best si- side man I could be. I'm going to do me a whole different way. But for right now, I'm going to make this continue to do this career, this great career that you have, and you're going to, yeah. you know, take care of your family, you're going to travel the world, love on everybody yep. and appreciate it. And I remember when you said, D, I'm good, I'm good with this. So, Toddy, when did, how long were you with Toby, and when did it finally come to an end with Toby? You just, you have to go through details, but how long were you with him, and when did it, when did it come to the, to an end? Yeah, I was I was with Toby just over twenty years, probably like twenty one years, and it came it came to an end uh, January twenty twenty one. So it's been it's just been a little over two years. A little over two years, and I know, man, how tough it was for you because you know you 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 love that whole camp. I mean, we we yeah. would talk, man, and you were just so happy. Um, but it was it just came the time for you to just just to move on and and. And, and plant seeds in other directions and and do other things and so I re- and I res- and I respect you for that and I respect I want to send a shout out to Toby man thank him for the opportunity of you know bringing me in to do a record with you on the Christmas record so Toby man yeah, if you're watching yeah. thank you thank you my brother appreciate that opportunity but um so Toddy let's talk about Lenny Kravitz 
All right. Okay. I, I, I want to just, we, I, you know, I just want to touch on the Lenny Kravitz. One day, all yeah. I remember is one day, you calling me, you saying, yo, bro, I'm going to be heading to L.A. I'm like, cool, what you doing, man? The, he says, man, I'm getting ready to hook up and audition with Lenny Kravitz. Man, I dang near hit the flow, man. I was like, what? Man, I was so happy, proud of you, man. So tell me about that whole experience, man. Wow, wow, Brother Lynn, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Lenny. Um, I was on tour with Toby Mac, um, and we had just pulled into Denver, Colorado, had a day off. I just checked into my hotel, and I'm sitting on the edge of the bed going through my phone. And I'm listening to my messages, and all of a sudden, I, the, one of the messages came on, and um, Dr. Mary said, Hello, Toddy. This is Lenny Kravitz calling. Please give me a call. And as he started to leave his number, about the first three, four numbers got out, and then the phone hung up. And so I sat on the edge of the bed, and I was like, <laughs> somebody played a joke on me. Is that really Lenny? Lenny Kravitz calling me, calling my phone? And I said, hmm. And so I called, I listened to the answering, I listened to the voicemail again. I said, no, that's dude. And so I said, let me make a call. So I made a call back to Nashville to uh, the friend Zora, played drums with me. And uh, I said, I said, Z, what's up, man? I said, hey, man. Um, I said, man, I think Lenny just called me. He said, yeah, man, he called me a couple weeks ago looking for it. I said, work, <laughs> okay. So anyway, I told I told Zorro, well, man, he was leaving his number, but you know, so Zorro gave me his number, and and in that instant, man, I, I sat I sat down for a second. I, I took a deep breath and I said, "Okay." And man, it's like a whole reel just flashed in front of me, and it was interesting because you know I, I tried not to get ahead of what was coming. You know, sometimes it's hard to do that. You start, you start seeing things. You start, you know, figuring stuff out. But I was like, okay, just, just chill. So, uh, B was in the my roommate. B Haley was in the room. So I said, well, man, I, I, I said to myself, I'm gonna go downstairs and, and, and take this call. So I went downstairs to the lobby and I called the number. And yeah, sure enough, man, Lenny picked up. And what was so cool, D? is that we talked for about 45 minutes and it was amazing. He told me that he'd been looking for a bass player. You know, and that's what, that's what Zoro said. Zoro said he thought he was looking for a bass player while she gave him calls and stuff. So when I was talking to Lenny, he said he, said he, he, he and his, well, his uh, guitar player, Craig Ross, and his uh, sound, his, his guitar tech saw me online and, uh, said, hey man, check this guy out. So then he said, he said he loved my look, he loved my playing, he said, he gave me a compliment, he said I played like him. So I'm like, okay, cool, I'll take that. You know, and so it was just really cool. You know, the conversation was really down to earth. I felt like I had known that brother for years. You know, and one of the things that he was looking for at the time, he was in a place in his life where he was really searching, you know, soul searching. He wanted some good, Christian guys around him to, you know, to, you know, to be of influence. I told him, I said, bro, I said, look, you know, it would be my honor to go deep with you like that, man. You know, I said, you know, I'll, I'll be your armor bearer, whatever you need, bro. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I know the ropes, you know, um, and and I just, I think that's awesome that you would, you know, look at me in that, in that light. And so anyway, man, we got off the phone and the important things about the gig, I forgot to ask. You know, like, okay, do I have the gig or am I coming to audition? Because it sounds like you're giving me the gig. You know? So it, it was almost like professional Toddy Funk had checked out because we had, we had bonded on this personal level that was just like, wow, it was like next level. Like I said, it felt like we'd known each other for years. And so it was cool because, you know, they said, all right, well, man, you know, you got an email coming. 
you know, I'm sending you the music, da 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 da. Just learn it. I'll fly to LA, we'll rehearse and go from there. And so I got the I got the rehearsal stuff. And you know what? I mean, it was cool. You know, it was it, you know had the bass on one side, vocals and everything on the other side, so I could really hear what was going on. And you know, the the it, the thing was the music wasn't hard. You know, I could play the music. You know, now you know no excuses. Um, but at that time, that was a, that was probably one of the heaviest times in my life. And you know what I'm saying? I won't go into it right here, but dude, I was in the middle of it. And you know what, D, looking back, and I've only shared this with maybe two people, is that I probably should no, I should have told Lenny, look, man, as much as I want to, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to waste your time because this is what's going on. Maybe at a different time we can revisit. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, the, uh, the immaturity in me, the, the, the insecurity in me, the, um, the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it, it escapes me right now, but anyway, just that place that I was in fearful. Okay. That something like this wouldn't come again. You know what I'm saying? I said, well, you know what? I'm just going to figure this shit out. I'm going to take this gig. I'm going to take this opportunity. I'm making it happen. However I need to happen. So I was on a plane to the Bahamas, and he was down there. We were going to try to hook up. He was in the Bahamas. We had some shows down there. It was really cool with Mary Mary and uh, some other artists. But um, So we were going to try to hook up. When I was down there, we just couldn't make it happen. But anyway, you know, I'm trying to, you know, deal with what I was dealing with and, and, and shed his music and do Toby and this, that, and the other, and then come back and get ready to fly out in another day or two. And um, so anyway, I get to L.A. and um, I go down to the, you know, uh, car brings me to the, the, the rehearsal spot. And um, I had never, well, I, I, it was that was only the second time I'd been in a, a, a situation like that. You know, that it, it was it felt so huge. I mean, it, you know, it wasn't like a regular, like, audition setting. And I, you could probably attest to it, like, when you did Janet, it probably felt, like, so big, you know, being in those rooms and that music just hitting, and you know what I'm saying? That's what it was like, man. It was like, it was crazy because Lenny, he wasn't even there for a long time. It was a lot of waiting around, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and uh, uh, Finally, when he comes in, it was wild, man. I mean, he, he comes in with his entourage. I mean, it was like he just walked in, people, somebody grabs a guitar, puts it on, and next thing I know, man, we counting the thing off, and I'm like, oh, shoot, okay. So, man, we in it, right? And, man, the, it was just loud and big. It was freaking awesome. And, dude, when I tell you, I went to, to, to I mean, I was not trying to take no prisons on that mother. Dude, my hair was out. <laughs> you know, I had my boots on. I had my dude. I had my rock and roll regalia on. I had my jazz man. We went into some stuff, man. And I looked at him, man. We was playing. I walked over to him, and we got back to back. You know, and he do that thing, and man, just you know, and the and the chemistry, our chemistry was really good. Our chemistry was really good. And I felt okay about the audition, and that's what it was at that point, you know, or whatever it was. Uh, I felt good about it. The thing is, you know, I'll be completely honest. I did not learn his song spot on. You know, that was one of those professional questions I should have asked him when he was on the phone while everything was cool. I should said, look, man, you look for more of a vibe. I mean, I can play your songs. You want me to kind of bell sheet? You want me to, or do you want me to play it just like the record? You know, and because I was dealing with what I was dealing with, I was like, okay, I know I can play this stuff. You know, and anything that I don't know 100%, I can learn, obviously. And so the, I went in kind of with that attitude. Not good. Not good. So after we after we played, you know, we, we got a bite. We sat down and talked. And again, it was just really cool. You know, it's just really cool. We talked about life. We talked about our kids. Um, uh, He's got a daughter about the same age as my daughter, and we shared pictures and we made some cool comments about my daughter, you know, and, and whatever, whatever. It's just really cool. And so um, we we uh, we didn't play anymore that night. We 
had another day, and then I, was, I went back home. Well, long story short, I didn't get the gig. Gail Ann Dorsey got the gig. And I respect Gail Ann. She was with Dana Boyd for quite a while. Uh, and and Lenny picked, picked her up, too, uh, to come in on the base chair. You know, there's some things that I can say, but I, I can't say them without it sounding like I'm bitter, but I'm not. There were just some other things going on in the room. You know what I'm saying? Uh, some other vibe that was going on in the room that I thought maybe had played into it because, you know, it's like, man, you know, I know, you know, playing this, learning this stuff, it's not, it's not a problem. I, you know, it's kind of like I was telling myself if I had another couple of days or whatever, but the deal is, no, that was the day. That was your day. You know what I'm saying? For whatever reason, that was your day. Regardless if you could have learned it in another two, you know, had it exactly in a, another day and a half, two days, that was the day. Right. So that was my biggest regret. And I held on to that story for a long time, D, because I was, I was embarrassed. You know, I, I felt like a fool. You know what I'm saying? And, and just the, the guilt trip that I took myself through coming back home, you know, and, uh, you know, just, you know, I, man, I really had to do some, <laughs> I had to do some work behind that <laughs> because that gig could have changed. I mean, it, it was a life changer for anybody. You know what I'm saying? And I love Lenny. And I love Lenny Kravitz. I always did from the very beginning. I said, this dude is a freaking rock star. You know, and that's, and that's what I want to be. I want to be a rock star, you know? And, you know, he just, he was so inviting. You know, I just kind of, in the midst of everything I was going through, I just kind of let my guard down, you know, thinking that it was going to be okay. And that was, and, and so I'm saying this to anybody who's not on a professional level, or maybe you are on a professional, I mean, it, it goes, Anyway, it, it's this taking something for granted, maybe, or no, let's just say it what it is, is. Don't take a situation for granted. Learn the song the way the artist wrote the song. Be and have no excuses, no apologies. You know what I'm saying? And that's the bottom line. You know, D. And, and my thing is, it, I can do that. I just should have done it at that time. I should have taken. I should have taken a step back. And either said, you know what, I got too much going on, or I should have just reevaluated and said, okay, this is how much I, this is how much time I've got. Is that enough time with everything else that's going on with your touring schedule? Right. You know. Well, the thing about it, man, I appreciate you for, and I've known you, I've known you've held that to your um, to your heart for all these years, man. I'm glad you're sharing it because what it's going to do is a teachable moment for somebody. Um, yeah. And I remember that so well, man. I, you were really going through yeah. some things, and um, um, you know, I, I prayed you up, man. And we all were praying for you, man. And and you know, dude, it, you know, it just wasn't meant to happen, man. But the fact that the opportunity, yeah. you know, um, was presented just made me proud, bro. Just because, and yeah. that's that's a good thing that came from your move. It that came straight from. The CCM thing, man, that he noticed you Absolutely. from that. So I yeah, was, I was, yeah, I was, that, I was. I'll say that. I'm sorry for cutting in this, the, the, yeah. the audio sometimes. Like it was, it was that visibility. Yeah. You know, Toby afforded me, he, he afforded me so much. Absolutely. Just by the fact that there was, I was just so visible. Yeah. You know, I mean, we toured, man, we toured three times a year. We toured in the spring, we toured in the summer, and we toured in the fall. Through the winter, like clockwork, yeah. and, and 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 my guys that 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 I would meet in the general markets and whatnot, you know, and, and especially on the gospel side because they they never toured like that, right? You know, and so it was like I knew that for me, somebody who loves a stage, who loves to perform, that man, this is really a blessing, man. I'm playing, I'm playing the you know the same arenas all through the country. I'm playing some of the biggest, you know, some of the the most coveted rooms in the world, Madison Square Garden, sure. Royal Albert Hall, sure. you know, the pond, you know, sure. all these rooms, you know what I'm saying? Like, dude, it don't get no better than this. It, it don't you know, get, it don't get no better, man. And, and, and truly, man, you know, dude, your life has been a tremendous blessing, man. You've inspired, influenced a lot of people, um, um, myself included. Um, real quick before I let you go, Todd, so what are you doing now? You're in Austin right now. What are you, what are you doing now? Real quick. Man, you know what, dude? I said, I said, 
you know, I, I thought about I, I thought about well, here I was in Atlanta um, for for a short minute for about a year. Atlanta's cool. I just you know I figured that if I was ever going to get back to the business of Toddy Funk, I needed to be in a in an artist community that supported independent music. And you know, doing my research, a lot of thinking, you know, a lot of meditating, and just you know, and talking with you know some old heads, you know, industry, you know, it's like Austin just made sense. You know, I've lived in Austin before, played with one of the baddest funk bands ever that produced some of the most talented musicians that have that have gone off to play. You know, you know, it's the same old story. But I mean, this place. For me, it's almost like a like a like a second homecoming, cool. and it feels good, you know, being back in Austin, good. Um, and and gearing up for, you know, Toddy Funk music, and the next chat, good. you know, good. and hopefully we'll get, we'll get this uh, this Gary Clark or Black Puma situation worked out. You know what I'm saying? Cool, so, man. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. So cool. I got my eye on a few things here too, cool. man, just to you know just. It, you know, just to stay relevant and right on, man, just man. Playing, but, but man, yeah. your your Toddy, your your story is amazing, man. I'm glad that you you're sharing it with me, man. Once again, and I know Austin, you like I, you know, I know you've been there, and you have a lot of people there, and I can't wait to see what you got coming next, man. Um, and I'm excited, man, for the future journey for you, brother, and um, and some of the things that you got. I know, and you know, you I know you got new music coming, and you know, in electric church. And so, I mean, I, I can't wait to see everything you got, you got coming here. If God is willing us, allow us to see it, man, to the, in the near future, man. Real quick, before I let you go, my brother, I got to ask you this question. You have four bass players that you're going to put oh, on you. <laughs> that you're going to put on your Mount Rushmore, man. Give me your four bass players, Toddy Funk. Man. Yeah, and I know you, so I kind of got an idea who they are, but I don't know. I'm not going to speak for you. I'm going to give you the floor. Give me your four bass players who you going to put on Mount Rushmore. I'm going to listen. Oh, my gosh. Why are you going to do me like this? Man, there's so many. I mean, there are so many for so many reasons. But if I had to, if I had to pick four bass players... Bootsy Collins is gonna be on on my Mount Rushmore, y'all. When I when I when I met Bootsy, I told him, I said, "Dude, I'm sitting in his house." I said, "Bootsy," I said, "My mom wouldn't even let us listen to your music." He starts shaking his head and laughing. <laughs> I said, "Man," I said, "The first time I heard your bass was on the Tales of the Kid Funkadelic album. The song was the Undisco Kid. The girl is bad." When that song opens up, Bootsy's got his Mutron just ripping and he slides into it and just goes, I said, oh my God, when I was a kid and I heard that I was done. You know, so so Bootsy, he, he holds a special place in in in, uh, in Funkman for me and, and a bass player, all right? Oh, next would be, why are you gonna do me like this, D? There's so many bad bass players. Um, but for me, I gotta say Marcus Miller gonna be on the Mount Rushmore. Because for me, when I was growing up, when I was coming up, the jazz tone that he had on them records, man, was just undeniable. He was producing his butt off. That and, and I'm a, I love the jazz bass. I love the sound. And and and, and Marcus Miller, you know, um, what he's done, his voice on that instrument has been has been a profound voice. I mean he's carved a niche for himself and he's and he's done his thing with with that with that with that jazz. So I gotta say Marcus, you know, that's that's just where I come from. Um gotta say one of unsung bass hero was Mark Adams from Slave. You know um Mark wasn't the most technical bass player. He wasn't the most proficient for war when he as Steve Arrington, lead singer for Slave, said, when he would hit them planks, dude, that tone, that, his bass tone was the sickest tone from just just a touch of love, the concept album, uh, uh, heck, even um, uh, 
what record is that with party lights and, and those joints the, the tone started to get a little crazy at toward the end i think it was he, he kind of started going for that more of that lead tone on the on the back pickup but i loved it full throttle that was the tone that i love with 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 mark adams um okay uh and then uh who else is going on the mount rushmore uh Oh yeah, what James, uh, what Bootsy did with James, so I gotta gotta throw that in there too, uh, aside from the funky devil P funk stuff and his own stuff. Um, last bass player, come on, D. Dare I say DOA Allen? You you'd be up there too, <laughs> but I'm not gonna tell you because we doing the show. But you already know the influence you had on me. Um, Man, one more bass player. And I just don't want to throw one out. Y'all, this is hard, man. Because sometimes I don't really think of it in these terms. Um, okay. Anthony Jackson. I'm going to say Anthony Jackson. Chaka Khan, Clouds, all that stuff, man. The Contra bass, you know, him coming up with that concept. Got to give it to Brother Anthony, man. Wow. You know, um, uh, Grover Washington Jr. stuff. His jazz tone is killing, you know. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put it right there, man. I mean, there's there's a ton of other cats I could could have, have thought of if I'd have known. I probably would have come up with a different four. But hey, I'm proud of those four, and I'm gonna leave it right there. D. Hey, well you, you well listen, man. All four are all the right answers, man. I'm gonna throw a five. You gonna be the fifth wheel. I'm gonna put you, I'm gonna put you on there because when it come down to the funk and the grease, y'all out there in America world. This is a greasy dude. I told y'all he showed up to Nashville with with a bucket of chicken and some skillets and some oh. grease and some the, the lard and the chitlins and the fat back and hog mong, collard green, turnip green, mustard green, everything, <laughs> everything yeah. that had to do with the funk. We had them, we had them, boy. I was ready to take that to my storm, dog. I was like, boy, here we go, man. <laughs> Funk, get ready to roll. You know what I'm saying? Toddy Funk, man, do me, do me one. And it is an incredible question to answer, but do me one last favor, man. Tell everybody how they can reach you, bro. Man, you guys, I'm still on social media. I haven't done a whole bunch, bunch lately, but that will change very soon. Um, I'm at uh, official Toddy Funk. My original Toddy Funk Instagram was hacked, so uh, don't mess with that. Um, I'm at official Toddy Funk, T O D D E F U N K. I'm, I'm there primarily. Um, uh, second season of the Toddy Funk show is coming. If y'all haven't seen the first show, the first season, Derek, like I said, he gives me an awesome, awesome story that first season. Um, it was great. So uh, the Toddy Funk show on Instagram, and then you can catch that on all uh, uh, streaming platforms. Anchor, Spotify, Google Play, Apple Music, all that. Um, you can catch me there. And then, uh, man, uh, Facebook, Toddy Funk, T O D D E F U N K, or Todd Lawton, L A W T O N, on Facebook. Man, love hearing from everybody, man. All the bass players, you know, that have been on this show, um, you know, have, have all, you know, touched in some way or another. I'm just glad to be in the crowd, D. I appreciate you for having me, bro. <laughs> man, man, listen, no, I thank you, man. Thank you so much, man, for for hanging out with me, man, on my platform Absolutely. and sharing just a little small piece of some of your history and some of your facts, man. I love you for it, brother. Once again, man, I want to ask everybody to please go like and subscribe to the channel. And um, thank you all for just hanging out with me and my brother right here, Toddy Funk. Y'all show your love for my Get brother. Yes, show man. your love for my brother, Todd, Toddy Funk, <laughs> Lawton slash Christian or Christian Lawton. Just the <laughs> funky, greasy man. Give your love for him, Toddy. I love you, man. <laughs> I love you too much love, much respect, DOA. Right, right on, right, man. man. Right on, brother.